and good evening and welcome back to another ASMIC session. Uh, the last one for 2020, it's December 3rd, uh, and we have a nice program for you tonight. Today's session is brought by our favorite sponsors. Um, you can see them all here. Without their help and their uh, sponsorship, we wouldn't be able to do all these nice uh, sessions for you, and we will not be able to make uh, uh, speakers be aware of ASIC and uh, attendees aware of ASIC. So thank you again, sponsors, for helping us out. Today on the program, we have um, Johnny. Johnny Hoiberis. Uh, we'll talk about Microsoft Quantum and Q-Sharp and Azure Quantum. Um, so uh, are you ready to be in a uh, Doctor Who scenario with him? Uh, let's see where we can head off with that uh, presentation. Of course, we are as if we are a community, we are a user group, and if you want to be uh, also presenting on our user group, we still have an open session ice where you can uh, fill out your uh, CFPs. You can still join us and present for us for our little community yourself if you're open to those things. Uh, of course, you can follow us on Twitter, uh, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. We have our website and do, 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 do subscribe to our newsletters to be um, kept aware of all the events that we're doing. Um, there's going to be a filled agenda again next year uh, for 2021, hopefully in better conditions. We'll see where we head off with, uh, with uh, 2021. Um, Johnny also is uh, followable at Twitter. If you want to ask him questions afterwards, you can follow him at djohnnyke at Twitter. Uh, so that way you can also stay in contact with the next speaker. And for the last part, the most important part, the ASIC crew wants to wish you happy holidays already in advance. I know it's a little bit early. We're still the beginning of the month, but happy holidays. Stay safe. Enjoy the family small family bubble this year for those who need to be in containment. And with that being said, and on that bombshell, I would say, Johnny, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for the introduction and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, last ASUC session for the year 2020. And today I will talk about Microsoft Q-Sharp and a little bit about um, Azure Quantum. So as Mike already told you, uh, my name is uh, Johnny Hoibergs. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. You can ask me questions on Twitter. Um, if after this session you have questions, and I, I think you will have many questions, um, you can always uh, contact me and I'll, I'll do my best to answer those questions for you. Um, a lot of my stuff that I do on these presentations is also available on my GitHub. Uh, so I have a, a GitHub and specifically for each event that I do, I have a, a separate repository containing all of the examples, but also the, the slides that I will use uh, tonight. So in the, in the bottom, very small in the bottom of my slides, you will see a link to, my, um, to the, the, the GitHub repository containing everything for tonight. But of course, if you just go to my general GitHub page, you will easily find um, those sessions if you look in the in the in the README file right there. Um, I work for a company, a Belgian company called Involved IT. Um, you can also contact me using that email address if you if you like to to, to use email uh, instead of social media. Um, and I've been teaching um, for uh, adult education institute in Antwerp called CVO Antwerp. Um, for 10 years now, uh, teaching students the basics of .NET and C Sharp, uh, basically. My job during the day is um, development, .NET and C Sharp development. I work as a consultant for Involved. Uh, I visit uh, different customers and I help them with mostly backend development. So why the hell am I doing a quantum computing talk then? Well, um, two years ago, I visited, I visited a conference in Belgium, Decorama. I saw uh, a, a nice presentation on quantum computing and the Microsoft Q Sharp specifically. And when I left the room, I was like, what just happened? I didn't really understand most of it. I understood a small portion. So that's why I decided to um, look into quantum computing myself in my free time, uh, started reading books, um, started doing some Q Sharp myself just to learn what quantum is all about. And this is basically the story that I want to share tonight uh, with you, my audience, um, just to tell you what I've learned these past two years and hopefully do a little bit of a better job than the person that I had the introduction from, because I really want to make this subject clear for software developers like myself. 
Um, tonight, um, I will be using Slido, um, which is a platform that adds a little bit of interaction to, to, to tonight because I am here uh, looking at my computer screen. I have no idea if you are there, what you are doing. Um, I can't ask you questions live, so I'm, I'm I want to try to make this a little bit more uh, interactive. So if you visit this link, this Slido link uh, on your smartphone, you are able to ask me questions during my presentation. And if you ask a question during my presentation from now, uh, so now and then I will look at those questions and I can answer them on the fly instead of at the end of the presentation. I also have some questions that I like to ask you, uh, the audience. So this platform will also give me the opportunity um, to ask these questions to you and also uh, see the results, see the answers that you uh, are giving me. So let's uh, let's dig right into quantum computing. Um, the presentation tonight will be somewhere between an hour and 90 minutes. Uh, it will probably be closer to 90 minutes than one hour because there's lots of content that I want to talk about. Quantum computing is not something easy to understand. So I have uh, lots of things that I want to discuss. Um, but again, you can ask me these questions while we're while we're doing this, um, and we'll see what happens. So first, I think the, the most important question is why are we why are we looking at quantum computing in general? Well, basically, the computers that we have today, the classical computers, as I would like to call them, um, they still have. I mean, we still have a lot of problems that classical computers cannot solve. Um, it's it's very hard to, to grasp, it's very hard to comprehend. Uh, today's computers are very powerful, but still there is many problems on this earth that are just too complex for a powerful computer to solve. Um, and also when we want to um, make classical CPUs and classical computers uh, more powerful, it's it it's, it's becoming just too difficult because the CPUs also have their physical limits. We can't uh, make them smaller and smaller each time because somewhere there we have the physical limits and 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 it becomes quite unstable uh, for us to use. Um, and then a very important uh, thing about 100 years ago, scientists um, found out that our world is quantum by nature. So there are quantum effects that are there on a very small scale, so on a molecular level. Um, so when we are trying to simulate these kind of physical problems, these physics problems. Um, yeah, why are we doing that on classical hardware? Maybe it will be uh, much more performant if we just create something quantum that can simulate a quantum uh, problem. That will probably make uh, more sense. So the the, the first time I, I was uh, introduced with a problem that is too difficult to solve by a classical computer was when I, when I was in high school. Um, I was in a class, uh, a technical drawing class, so we, need, we uh, needed to use computers and um, AutoCAD to um, create uh, drawings, mechanical drawings. I was, I was uh, finished with my exercise quite quickly and uh, the teacher came up to me. He knew, he knew I was already doing some, some programming in my, in my free time because I was a geek, basically. I was doing some, uh, some uh, Turbo Pascal uh, pro programming then. And uh, he told me, there is, a, there is a problem that I would like you to solve. He said, if you have a chessboard, one of the pieces on a chessboard called uh, a knight, uh, represented by a, a horse piece, it can make a horse jump. And a horse jump is basically uh, a move that has three steps. It's two horizontal steps and one vertical step, or two vertical steps and one horizontal step. So the result is the, the image you can see on the left-hand side. It's the horse that can jump to these eight possible locations. And then the teacher told me, if you start at a random position on this board um, and you keep on making the same horse jumps around, uh, you are actually uh, able to visit each square once and only once and then visit all of the squares. He said that is a problem because, of course, if you make the wrong decisions, you, get, you can get stuck because your eight possibilities may already be have been exhausted because you already visited those those squares. So then you need to backtrack and you need to find another route until you can find a solution. And on the right hand side, you can actually see a solution. So this is something that I drew by hand on a computer, but I drew it by hand. So this is actually, if you follow these lines, it's a horse jump 64 times visiting each square uh, and never visiting a square more than once. 
So the problem is solvable. But then when I was about uh, 14, 15 years old, I was trying to do the same thing in Turbo Pascal. And I wrote an algorithm. I was pretty sure I didn't make any mistakes. I pressed start and my computer started calculating. It's only 64 squares, so it shouldn't be too hard for a computer to solve. But I let the computer run for a couple of minutes, no solution. I kept it running for a couple of hours, no solution. I thought I made a mistake. I kept it running overnight in the morning, still no solution. So basically after a few weeks of fiddling around and debugging my code, I just gave up. I had some, I, okay, I probably made a mistake, Never mind. And I've never heard about this problem again until I was uh, out of school a couple of years ago, I learned that this problem is called a night tour. And the concept of this problem is to explain to you that this is actually pretty difficult to solve for a computer to brute force because there are so many different paths and so many different options to visit all of those squares that a computer will just do billions and billions and billions of different paths and will never find a solution, or at least it, will, it won't find a solution um, for many years. There's of course uh, specific methods you can use to make it solvable, uh, to make it solve quicker. Um, but the point is if you make the wrong decisions all the time by accident, this can take thousands of years to actually reach its destination. And that is just mind blowing a thousand years for something that is so simple, it, that's crazy. Another example that I have is, um, is basically uh, even more more uh, difficult to to comprehend. So let's say um, you take a piece of paper, just like just like this one, piece of paper. This is, by the way, a drawing by a, a child of a friend of mine for me because I like roller coasters. She drew a roller coaster for me, so very cool. I will keep this on my wall. Um, but this is a, a regular piece of paper. Um, it's about 0.1 millimeter in thickness, which means that if I fold it double it will become 0.2 millimeter in thickness. And if I fold it again two times, it's 0.4 millimeters in thickness because the thickness will double which e uh, with each fold. So if I go to, um, to my uh, Slido, let's see. So this is my Slido. So if you visit this link, uh, you will be able to answer my question. And my question is, if I take this piece of paper and I fold it 42 times, it's 42 times, it's quite a compre comprehensible number. It's not a lot, 42. But if I fold it 42 times, guess the total thickness of my folds. Do you have an idea? So as I said before, uh, it's just a single um, it's just a single piece of paper is 0.1 millimeter in thickness. Um, so if I fold it once, it's 0.2 millimeters. If I fold it uh, twice, it's 0.4 millimeters. What happens if I fold it 42 times? Just have a guess. Exactly. So I got somebody who, who guessed 2 to the power of 42. Well, it's actually 0.1 times two, times two, times two, times two, and this 42 times. And the cool thing about this is basically the thickness will be half of a million kilometers, 400,000 meters. That's the distance between the earth and the moon. And that's just mind blowing. 42 times is such a small number, but folding a stupid piece of paper 42 times reaches a thickness of half a million kilometers. Obviously, you're not it's not possible to fold this piece of paper 42 times. Um, you will probably reach six or seven times, I guess. And then it becomes very difficult or even impossible to fold even more. But in theory, 42 folds half a million kilometers. And this is basically the reason why quantum computer computers can help us um, solve these problems because um, quantum computer works quite differently. And today I will try to explain to you why that is. Um, but first we need to use some concepts from uh, physics. So uh, quantum physics talks about uh, the concept of superposition and entanglement. Um, and these properties can help us to create computers that actually use these phenomena to uh, its advantage. And hopefully we can then solve um, exponentially difficult problems uh, by using that. So what is superposition? Well, superposition um, 
is actually a state where a property of, a, of an object can be multiple values at the same time. And I will explain to you later that that is actually not entirely correct. It's not multiple values at the same time. It's some kind of probability of possibilities. Um, and this also only works on very, very uh, microscopical objects. So it doesn't work with uh, with the chair that, you, that you're sitting on. That object is too large to actually have something that can be in superposition. But it only works with very small particles like an electron or a photon, these, these uh, very small particles. And the first time that, 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 some, that, we, that we were investigating all of these things um, were already happened in the early 1800s. So the early 1800s, that's more than 200 years ago. So basically there was a scientist called Thomas Young and he did an experiment, not because he wanted to do something with quantum physics, but he wanted to, um, to do an experiment to prove that light that light that shines on your face right now, that that is actually behaving like a wave. So he devised an, uh, an experiment called a double slit experiment. And he based himself upon his knowledge of waves like in water or uh, or sound waves. Because we know if we have a square um, bucket of water and we drop a marble in the middle of this um, pool of water, that then we get then we create waves in the water. So in this case, because we drop a marble, it's going to be circular waves, and those waves will move towards the edges of the pool. The same thing happens when we uh, when we push the edge of a pool, then we get linear waves, and those waves will travel travel from one side to the other side of the wave pool, or of the pool containing waves. So he had an experiment that said, okay, if I create a barrier halfway in between those two edges, and I create two gaps or two slits within that barrier, the waves will hit the barrier, and then the waves will actually create new waves that will pass through the barriers, uh, through the, the slits, and then at the other end of these slits, we will have circular waves that move forward, but now we have two separate waves. Those two separate waves will touch each other eventually, they will hit each other, they will interfere with each other, and they will create a pattern on the uh, on the final edge of the the pool, and this pattern pattern will actually actually be based on the amplitudes of that wave. So if you if you just think about water waves, if you if two waves in water are hitting each other, the the, the resulting wave will become much higher because you basically add the amplitude of both waves together, and then you have a higher wave. The same with with the places just before and just after the wave. When you have a, a slight gap before and after the wave, if those gaps meet, you will create a deeper, an even deeper gap. And if a wave and a gap, if they meet each other, they will cancel each other out and they will actually result in a flat water surface, surface with no wave at all. So this will actually be visible on that final edge uh, and it, you will see that the water will hit higher in certain places and it will hit lower in other places. And Thomas Young, did this experiment in the uh, early 1800s to prove that light was also a wave by shining light through the barrier with the two slits and then looking at the pattern uh, at the end of the of the room that he was trying to do this on and yes indeed he could prove this way that light was indeed a wave because the same interference pattern was emerging uh, and now we all know that that light actually acts as a wave we know that the, the frequency of the wave actually corresponds to the to the the, the color of the light, um, but we also know that light also behaves as particles. It's basically a beam of particles and those particles are photons. So life, light is a wave, but also uh, a bunch of particles, so it's both. Uh, so 100 years later, in the beginning of the 1900s, when scientists were actually doing experiments on the quantum level, and then they um, they actually saw that quantum mechanics was really a thing, and this is the experiment that helped them um, think about that. It was still the double slit experiment, but now they were not using water or they were not using um, uh, light, but they were using small particles like electrons, and they created an experiment with uh, some kind of device that um, was able to shoot electrons, and they used the device to shoot electrons at a wall and inside of this wall was a slit. And then some of the electrons would hit the wall, the wall or the barrier and some of them would pass through. And then they had some kind of surface at the end of the room that would actually reflect um, all of the electrons that hit 
that final wall. So it, it had some kind of reflective surface where you could actually see the electrons hitting the wall so that they could take measurements basically on what happened. Uh, so when this worked, they worked on the double slit experiment from Thomas Young, but now with electrons. And they were very excited because now they could see that actually very small particles also act as a wave. Because when they shoot a bunch of electrons through a double slit barrier, they could see the same interference pattern as with waves. So in, for some reason, these particles are also acting as a wave. Um, and then they thought, yeah, probably that's because they bounce off of each other. Because when they uh, go through the slits, then they maybe hit each other and they fly all over the place, creating the interference pattern. Um, so we, we really want to see what happens there. We want to measure um, the electrons while going through the slits. So they put a camera on top of those two slits. And now, for some reason, when they repeat the experiment using, uh, it's not really a camera, it's going to be a measurement device, but uh, that doesn't really make, uh, that doesn't really, is, is uh, important right now. But when they, when they did the experiments another time with the camera, looking at which slit was actually being used by which electron, for some reason, the interference pattern was gone. So they were shooting the same electrons, but now they were just hitting the final wall in these two uh lines and this, this is actually what you should expect when you when we when we do something like that with macroscopic elements like with a paintball gun this is a, exactly what we what we would expect but then when they remove the measurement device in the camera again the same interference pattern again emerges and this is the basic concept of what superposition is actually uh, uh, what superposition actually is so basically the idea is that when we shoot the electron it's a very small particle, and that particle is not really in touch with our reality. Um, it basically exists as a wave, and this wave just describes the probabilities of that electron being at a specific place and time within our universe. And that wave is, is the thing that passes through the slits. And when that wave passes through the slits, it gets split up into separate waves. Those waves will interfere with each other. And then when they finally hit um, the surface in the end, based on the probabilities in that wave, the electron will come back into our reality uh, and it will hit the bar uh, it will hit the final wall in the in the in the position um, correlate correlated to a probability from that wave. So basically when the wave has a very high um, amplitude, the probability will be higher for that electron to hit that specific spot. And when the, the amplitude of the wave is very low on a specific place on the wall, um, it will have a very low probability of hitting that wall at that place. When you put a camera on the slits, you basically force the electron to collapse its wave and to make the decision right there. And then the electron will make the decision, where am I going to hit? Oh, I'm going to hit the barrier or one of the two slits. And then it will pass through the slits. There's no more wave. There's only the electron that basically comes back into reality. And then it will just travel straight through um, and it will hit the final wall. So a cool thing about the superposition is it exists elements or uh, um, elementary particles can be in a state of superposition, but when we observe them, when we measure them, they will take a decision based on a probability wave function. Uh, and when that function collapses, um, it will act based on that probability. Um, and the only thing that I can actually think of in our real world that acts a little bit like this is a USB stick. When you have a USB stick and you want to plug it in your computer, um, you need it. It won't. It, it will never fit. You always have to turn it around a couple of times. Uh, it will. It will still not. It will still not fit. And then you need to observe it. You need to observe the the USB slot in your PC. Then you will see its orientation. Then it will collapse its superposition, and then you are able to to plug it in because now it may, it has made a decision. So this is the only thing I know um, that actually works like this. All all of these other things other objects that superposition works on are all on a microscopical level. Um, the second thing is entanglement, and this is something even more spooky. Um, sometimes two quantum objects can actually be entangled, which means that they are somehow connected. And when they have a property that is in superposition, um, those two entangled particles have the same property in superposition. And when you measure one of those objects, only one of those, the other object will immediately also collapse its wave function and it will make the decision that is the opposite of the other entangled particle. So if you have, for example, two electrons, which can have a spin up or a spin down, which is basically the image on the right hand side here, 
so a spin up and a spin down when it's in superposition it has a spin up and a spin down at the same time if those two uh, objects are entangled and you look at one of the two objects it makes a decision based on that probability and let's say it, it says spin up then the other element will automatically be spin down at that exact moment in time which is crazy um the, there is an experiment that's being done uh, that, that has been done a couple of years ago and that's still ongoing where the Chinese, Chinese scientists have launched uh, um, a satellite in space about 100 kilometers uh, hovering on top of the earth um, and it has a device that is able to split a photon in half and if you split the photon in half chances are quite high that those two half photons are entangled and then they use laser beams to um, transport these entangled photons to a laboratory in China and another laboratory in um, in Austria, in Europe. Um, they don't do this with only one particle. They will shoot uh, many, many, many millions and millions of uh, entangled photons to these laboratories. And in these laboratories, they can actually uh, measure the, 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 the state or a state of this uh, photon. For example, the polarization of light, uh, vertical or horizontal pol polarization is, is a property that can be in superposition. And then these scientists see that if they make a measurement in Austria, which it says it is horizontal uh, polarization, then for some reason um, in China it's the other it's the the other way around, and it always works. When they do it millions and min millions of time times, it will always be the reverse of what happened in the other lab, which is just crazy. Um, the polarization is just an example. It's not really based on polarization. They, they take some kind of other uh, property, but my physics physics knowledge is not. Um, um, advanced enough to actually understand how they do this, but they've proven they've proven that it works. So so, this is just crazy. And the reason they are they are doing this at space scale is because they want to prove that there's no communication between those objects. When they when you have uh, an entangled uh, two entangled particles, when you measure one, the other one will immediately collapse to the opposite uh, value immediately. There's no delay. Uh, they timed it, there's no delay, it happens immediately, and it happens faster than light, and nothing can go faster than light, so scientists decided that there's something else more spooky going on, but we basically don't know what's happening. Um, so why, why, in, why in God's name would we do these things? Why do we need these quantum computers? Well, there are already some ideas uh, about what we can use it for. For example, security. Um, in the 90s, in the, the early 90s, uh, 1990s, there were already computer scientists that um, have an idea about algorithms that can actually um, factorize very large numbers into prime factors. And this is basically the idea for our public-private key encryption. So public-private key encryption is based on the idea that if you take two very large prime numbers and you multiply them together, you get an even larger number. Um, but if you have the larger number, it's actually almost impossible to go back to the, your original prime factors because that would need a brute force algorithm on a classical computer. Uh, fact factorizing is basically brute forcing. You really need to check, okay, which two numbers do I need to multiply together to reach my 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 question, my original number. Um, but in the, the other way around, when you have your two prime factors and you multiply them together, that's very easy. That's, that's even a simple calculator can do something like that. Um, so this is the power of public-private key encryption because the large number is basically your private key. Um, I'm sorry, your public key, and your two separate prime numbers, your two prime factors, that is your private key. So your private key should be kept private. That is very secretive. So you have those two separate numbers. And then the public key is the very large number. So if you give that to somebody else, the very large number, they are able to encrypt data, um, but they can't, um, they can't use that large number to generate a private key from that because they just can't factorize that number. It's too large. Um, but vice versa, when you have the private key, so the two separate numbers, you can just multiply them together to generate a public key. And that is what uh, public-private key encryption is based on. It's a little bit more difficult than that, but that is the idea that it's based on. Um, there is a quantum algorithm that exists today that is actually able to solve this issue, that, that can solve this issue a lot quicker than a classical computer. If you would use a classical computer on the algorithm that we use today for public-private en encryption, it would take thousands of years. If you use a quantum computer, it 
but in theory could be done in a couple of hours or days. And that is actually breaking the encryption. But uh, luckily enough, today we don't have um, the physical quantum computers yet that are stable enough and that are powerful enough to use this algorithm. So the algorithm exists in theory, but we don't have the practical implementation to, to do it. So we're safe for, for a couple of years still. Um, second uh, thing would be drug development. As I told you before, the world we live in is quantum by nature. And if we um, administer drugs to a patient, basically, that works on uh, a very basic level of uh, elements in your body. So the, 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 the atoms in your body will interact with the drugs. So we need some way to simulate that in order to know what the drug will actually do. But it's it, there, there's too many variables to do on a classical computer. There are so many particles inside of your body that will interact with each other, that will interact with the drug uh, or, the, or the medication. Um, it, it's, it's no way, we are no, no way near uh, enough powerful machines to actually um, simulate that. And that's the reason why we do um, tests on animals. Um, so we hope that with quantum computing, we have the power to simulate a quantum system, drugs interacting on our system with actual, um, with actual um, uh, quantum uh, computers. And this, an example, can be interaction between molecule, molecules or gene sequencing or protein folding, stuff like that. Uh, hopefully, hopefully. So probably still uh, many years in the future, but uh, hopefully quantum computing can help us with that. And then the final thing that is very, um, very popular today is machine learning. Uh, so machine learning is also analyzing large quantities of data, and you want to have, you want to have artificial intelligence that can deliver fast feedback based on very large quantities of data. Uh, and uh, that is specifically the case when you try to emulate a human mind. There's so many decisions to take on such a short time frame uh, with so much data that it's just too difficult for a classical computer to emulate. And hopefully the power of quantum computing can also help us to make these decisions uh, more quickly. And again, we have very uh, low understanding of how the human mind works. It's also quantum by nature. So hopefully we can do more simulation with quantum computers uh, for that. So um, already half an hour um, in this presentation, and I didn't talk about the most important question of all. Um, the most important questions for quantum computers is, are they able to run crisis? So can we run crisis on a quantum computer? Everyone wants to know this. This is the thing that we use to, to measure if a computer is actually powerful. Um, and the story that I want to tell with this is that a quantum computer will be something that is very specific to uh, problems. You can't just run everything on a quantum computer. We should really um, spend a lot of time to figure out an alg algorithms that can solve our problems. And we need to, to make those algorithms very specific so that they can run on a quantum computer. So a quantum computer will not um, replace a classical computer. It will only be used for these very specific problems that can be solved more quickly than on a classical computer. In theory, um, there is already an architecture out there for quantum computers, and they are able to also run classical algorithms, but it wouldn't really make any sense because it's it's very expensive to run um, simulations on a quantum computer. Um, so yeah, it will be just too expensive to run classical things on a quantum computer. So we should use it for very important stuff, and we should use the classical computers we have today for everything related to classical al algorithms, like playing a game, for example. Um, I will spend some time now to um, talk a little bit about the bits and qubits and also a little bit about math. Um, I know math is hard. Um, I do think if I, if I read a page that is full of math, I will just zone out and I won't think about it. Um, but for quantum computer computers and in order to understand quantum al algorithms, you really have to have to know a little bit of math. So I will do a, a small introduction. Don't be afraid, don't be scared. Um, you, you will not die. Um, just take my word on that um, and just follow my lead uh, and we will, we will see what happens. But don't worry, you will not die. So if you think about bits, that is very easy. That a bit can be zero or one. If you combine multiple bits together, we can have 
uh, representation for data, for example. So 100110 is actually a representation of a number, but it can represent whatever data uh, we'd like to assign to it. Um, this is how a bit works. If we are talking about quantum computing, we are actually just translating the same concept to a different architecture. And we also like to to, to, um, to talk about bits in quantum computing, because we are already used of this binary logic. Um, and a qubit, which is the quantum representation of a bit, um, actually can also hold binary values. Because if we talk about uh, quantum properties on very small objects, like for example, the spin of an electron, the spin of an electron is a, is a, is a binary property. It can be up, or it can be down. So we can actually translate that into up is zero and down is one, for example. Um, so we can use the spin of an electron as a quantum bit because it can represent our binary data. Um, but the cool thing here is that it can also use superposition to represent both values at the same time. And this is where the power of quantum computer computers um, are coming from. So if we look at bits and qubits, um, the difference is actually made in the notation. So we can see here that there's a bit zero and a bit one, but we know that we are talking about qubits because we have a small mathematical representation. And this is called the Dirac notation, uh, named after a French mathematician called Paul Dirac. Um, so the Dirac notation. So if you see something like this, you know that it's the state of a qubit. And if you see something like this, you know it's the state, the state of, a, of a classical bit. Also, these quantum bits can be combined to represent data, um, and we still use the bracket notation for that. So just a vertical line and then some kind of larger than sign, but it's not really larger than, it's a specific sign in mathematics called, uh, it's part of the Dirac notation. Um, now, of course, when we want to represent a superposition, we need to represent some kind of mathematical formula that's tells us that there's a superposition between this zero and one state. And we actually do that like this. So we have some kind of alpha value times the zero state plus some kind of beta value times the one state. So this is a sum that uh, represents a superposition state of zero and one. And in the mathematics behind this, there's a formula that you need to look at that the fact is that the numbers that you use for alpha and beta should actually um, follow this formula. So the, the alpha number squared plus the beta number squared should always equal one. And the reason for this is actually that alpha and beta will describe the probability of that uh, superposition to collapse to zero or one. So if alpha and beta are the same value, the probabilities are equal. So there's a 50-50% chance of that collapsing to zero or one. So think about the USB stick. Um, if that is in perfect superposition, it has a 50% chance of being oriented up and a 50% chance of being oriented down, for example. But these probabilities can shift. Sometimes the probability for collapsing to zero can be higher than the probability for collapsing to one. But then these, these alpha and beta probabilities need to be correlated. So the total probability should always equal 100%. So this formula should always equal one. Um, to really make mathematicians very happy, um, the alpha and beta values should actually be complex numbers. So it's not just a real number, it's a complex number. Um, so again, don't be afraid of this math. Um, the reason for this is to be able to resolve all of our questions and all of the different states that the superposition of a physical object can actually be in. Mathematicians really need to use complex numbers to be able to represent all of these different uh, kinds of states. Uh, so that's that's just how it is. And we need to learn to calculate with these complex numbers to continue our work in quantum computing. Um, if we look at uh, a perfect superposition state of 50 percent zero 50 percent one um, then actually this is the this is the, the the mathematical representation of that because if you need to work with this formula alpha alpha squared plus beta squared should equal one then your 50 percent is actually one over square root of two so if you're reading about quantum computing and you will see and you will see a lot of square roots don't be afraid this is just to represent these probabilities um, yes so um, I've done a lot of talking already, so I just want to ask you one more question in uh, in Slido. So let's see if I can find it. Um, there we go. So 
just remember, this is the representation of a perfect 50-50% superposition, 50% 0, 50% 1. So now let's move to my question. So if you take a look at this quiz and if you um, take part in this quiz, if we would have a 75% chance of collapsing to zero and a 25% of collapsing to one, so the, the, the probabilities here are shifted, um, what would the actual mathematical formula be? Uh, and this is uh, not the very best representation of that. Um, so the first uh, one is half times zero and half times one. The second answer is three fourths times zero and one fourth times one. The third is square root of three over two times zero plus one over two times one. The fourth is square root of three divided by square root of two times zero plus one divided by square root of two of one. So this is this is already mathematics, but please take a little bit of time and try to find an answer. Um, so remember the formula, remember that you need to uh, take the, the, squ the square of the alpha value plus the squared beta value, and that should equal one. So please um, try to pick the correct question. And if you really have no uh, interest in solving this, then you can select the last answer. So I'm going to drink some water. And then let's see the result. So there's um, not, not everyone has the same has the same idea. Um, so let's just immediately look at the correct answer. And the correct answer is actually square root of 3 over 2 times 0 plus 1 over 2 times 1. Again, the reason for this is it's a mathematical representation. And you need to take the alpha value squared. So square root of 3 over 2 squared is actually the square root of 3 squared is 3. Now we lose the square root. Now we just remain with 3. And then if you square the 2, uh, below the line, you have 4. So we have 3 over 4 times 0. And then the second, uh, the beta value is half. And if you square half, you get 1 over 4. So 1 over 4 times 1 is 25%. And 3 over 4 times 0 is 75%. So this is how you mathematically represent those um, probabilities. So as you can see, it's not very, very uh, straightforward. So if you are... Uh, really, if you really want to understand quantum computing in, in, a, in more detail, you should do a little bit of math. You should do some exercises uh, to really get acquainted with this because I, I, I'm, I make a lot of mistakes still when I read this stuff. Um, it, is, it is something different than just binary logic. Binary logic you can do from the top of your head. Quantum binary logic is a little bit more dif difficult to do from the top of your head. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so yeah, if we look at the quantum state, um, we can recap and say that a classical bit is zero, but a quantum bit can also be zero and the same for one. Then we have this uh, combined state, the superposition state, which is a probability wave describing what is the probability of collapsing to zero and what is the probability of collapsing to one. Alpha and beta are complex numbers. I will come back to the reason why they are complex number in just a few minutes. Um, also remember that this superposition is uh, actually collapsed when you measure. So when you actually look at the bit, at the binary value, it will collapse to either zero or one based on those probabilities. Um, and then you can actually make a graphical representation of that. So if you look at this, this is what we call a block sphere. And a block sphere is a, uh, is a, is a visual representation of the state of a single qubit. Basically, on the basically the state is a vector in three-dimensional space that originates in the center of these uh, x, y, z axes, uh, and it will be a vector that points to somewhere on the surface of this sphere. Um, the length of the vector is always one, and this is the same mathematical representation as the one that I showed you earlier with that formula, where alpha squared plus beta squared should equal one. If you have two complex numbers you actually have a three-dimensional representation of a vector. Those two complex numbers together are a 3D uh, representation of a vector in, in space. So basically that means that if you have a, a zero state, you have a vector that points straight up on the z-axis. And if you have a one state, it's a vector that points straight down on the uh, z-axis. That is the 
um, the direct states, the classical states, zero and one. If you have a superposition state, you have a vector that is somewhere in between those two states, wherever inside of the sphere, pointing at some location on the surface of the sphere, but not straight up and not straight down. And when I'm talking about a superposition state with probabilities can be can be a lot of values. It actually can be an infinite amount of, of, uh, of different possibilities um, because you can play with those two uh, probabilities. And on the right hand side, you can see a vector that points slightly up somewhere between the Z and the Y axis. And this is actually uh, a state that has higher probability of collapsing to zero and lower probability of collapsing to one because it is of, obviously it is closer to the straight up state of the of the zero state. Um, and yeah, as I told you, mathematics is hard, but this helps us a little bit. And this uh, is this is able to show us the visual representation of a superposition state. Also, when this vector is somewhere on this plane, this plane shared by the x and the y axis, it's in perfect superposition. So it now has a 50-50% chance because you can see if it collapses, uh, it can collapse up or down with an equal amount of angle around uh, the y-axis, so it's 50-50. If I simplify uh, the block sphere to only two dimensions, I can show you the mathematical representation next to the visual uh, representation. If the zero state is all the way up and the uh, one state is all the way down, a perfect superpos superposition state of one over square root of two times zero and one over square root of two times one, we have a perfect superposition. And you actually have mathematical formulas that can calculate from this to an angle, and this is actually pi over two, which is um, 100 and uh, which, is, which is 90 degrees, um, 90 degrees angle, uh, straight angle. But if you shift around these numbers, and you have one over two and square root of three over two, you actually have a 120 degrees angle, and you can do the calculations to to calculate those angles to do your uh, visual representations. It's basically if this is your angles in rad your angle in radians, so two pi over three radians is 120 degrees. You just take a sine of that. Um, and you get one of these two alpha and beta values, and you do a cosine of this, and you get the other value. So it's very easy to to calculate uh, in between those. So yeah, let's. Um, I will shut up about math mathematics right now. You have the idea. There's a lot of math involved. You know a little bit what superposition is. Let's get more uh, practical here. So another thing that actually explains why quantum computers um, can be uh, more performant is the fact that if you have a two qubit system, uh, so a one qubit system has a probability of collapsing to zero or one, but a two qubit system actually has four of these probability probabilities because now it can collapse to zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. Uh, and now we have four probabilities, so we have four complex numbers. And this is actually the reason why quantum computer is hopefully more powerful than classical computers. Because when we add a qubit to the system, we double the amount of probabilities, we double the complexity of the superposition shared in that shared quantum state. Um, so, so very cool. So if you think about adding one more uh, qubit to that system, I'm not going to ask you the question through Slido, just think from the top of your head, very quickly, if I have th three qubits, how many probabilities do I have? I'm going to take another drink. Uh, indeed, you have eight probabilities. So you just add a single qubit and you double the amount of data you can have in a superposition state. Um, and this is, again, this is the reason why we hope that quantum computers are more powerful than classical computers. Because if you have a classical computer, the one that you're using right now, it has a CPU, it's then there's probably billions of transistors inside of that, that CPU. Um, in order to double the capacity or the power of your CPU, you need to double the amount of uh, transistors. So you need to add another billion transistors or so to your system to double the power. For a quantum quantum computer, if you have a 10 qubit system, if you want to double the, 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 the power of that system, you only have to add one qubit and you have 11 qubits and you doubled the power. So adding a qubit is creating an exponentially more powerful system. And this can hopefully help us to create to solve exponential problems, because if you add one variable to an already complex problem, 
that problem becomes exponentially more complex. It becomes double so complex. So hopefully a quantum computer can solve it if you just add if you just add a couple of qubits. So fingers crossed for that. Um, I will talk about these things from um, from Q sharp basically. But for, before we go to Q sharp, I just want to um, go look at um, our competitors, or at least the competitors from Microsoft, and I want to. Um, look at IBM because IBM is also doing quantum computing, but I'm just using IBM as an example because they have a, created a very nice web application that actually visualizes a quantum algorithm quite nicely. So they have what's called an IBM quantum experience, and this is a nice visual representation of what we are actually doing with quantum computing and quantum algorithms. So basically here I have three qubits. These three qubits have a timeline. And on top of this timeline, I can drag operations. And you should really think about this as the classical operations we can do on binary logic. So on binary logic, we can use gates. Gates like a NOT gate, an AND gate, an OR gate, and so on. Uh, for quantum computer, computing, we're doing exactly the same thing, but the gates are different. And you can see a list of these gates in the top. There is one of these gates that will actually um, put a qubit in superposition, and that's the H gate or the Hadamard gate. Excuse me. Putting one single qubit through the Hadamard gate will put it in a superposition state. So now it's it's actually in perfect superposition. It's 50% 1, 50% 0. And it's also being visualized in a, in a diagram in the bottom. We have three qubits that will represent three bits. So the three bits can be 0, 0, 0 or 0, 0, 1 with a 50% probability for both. Uh, the 0, 0 are the bottom two qubits. I'm not using them. I'm not putting them in superposition. I'm only using the top qubit. So only the last um, bit will actually be 0 or 1 with a 50% chance. If I add another qubit in superposition, we will now have 20 five percent probability of four values zero 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 one zero one zero and zero one one and then if you add the third qubit from my example we now have eight possibilities or 12.5 percent um, and now we can actually use this to draw um to basically draw a circuit draw an algorithm that does different kinds of operations on these qubits and we can run that on a simulated environment or even on an actual quantum computer from IBM. And they actually have a list of their quantum computers that they already um, make available to us. Um, and you can see that most of them have only five qubits. So five qubits is not a lot, um, but it's it's cool for testing purposes and for learning. Um, for, so if you want to learn about quantum computer computers, just have a look at this uh, quantum computing IBM uh, thingy. Uh, it will give you a very visual representation of, uh, of what we're doing. So I have a link in my PowerPoint slides. Um, I am looking at Slido and I can see that there is actually already some questions there. So I, I will already uh, answer those questions um, because I think that is actually um, easier for you. So some Jasper is asking, so alpha and beta cannot be one. Actually, yes, they can be one um, because one squared um, is still one. And if you look at the formula for alpha and beta, um, if your superposition state with alpha and beta is actually not a superposition state, and uh, it is actually the zero or the one state, then the alpha or beta value will be one. Because now you have uh, alpha, for example, being one times the zero state, plus beta, which is zero times one, which is 100% probability of collapsing to zero because it is zero. So alpha and beta can be one, uh, but this will just represent that it has a 100% probability of collapsing to zero or one. So it's actually not in superposition. Um, obviously, the, together they need, they need to pass the formula and be one. So if one is one and the other one is zero, that is perfectly fine. But of course, they cannot both be one. Um, so there is already an answer there. I think it can, but it has no quantum properties. Exactly the same. Um, so there, it's not in superposition. It's just a, a, a binary representation of zero or one. Alrighty. That, that's also the reason why I'm, I'm always repeating um, the same thing. When I say one and zero at the same time, that is just wrong. It's not at the same time. It's just like something in between. 
it's zero and one with a probability. So it's not those two values at the same time. The moment you measure, it takes a decision. So it's just undecisive. Um, so very important there. It's it's just easier for, for us to, to, to call it at the same time, but it's not really like that. So um, yeah, already 15 minutes in, let's go to some actual Q sharp because I think most people really want to see some Q sharp. Um, so let, let's find Visual Studio Code. So Q Sharp is actually um, a language created by Microsoft because they really wanted to, to do some things with all of this quantum stuff. So IBM already has quantum computers. Microsoft does not. Um, or at least Microsoft is working on um, Microsoft is working on their own quantum computer, but it's not yet finished. So they are still working on that. Microsoft is, is working together with external vendors. So uh, external companies that already created quantum computers that actually work. Uh, and they will, uh, they will make the use of those quantum computers available in the future by using their Azure platform. So that's the reason why we're here. Um, I will talk a little bit about Azure quantum also. So this is just a very small test project, but Q Sharp is a language that looks a little bit like um, a combination of F Sharp and C Sharp. So this is a Q Sharp application. And it's actually, it, 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 it also looks a little bit familiar to .NET because it has a namespace, it has using, so we're opening namespaces, existing namespaces that will contain methods that we can use. Um, it has methods, but these methods are actually called operations and functions. So it's a little bit different. A method or an operation has a name, it can have parameters and it has a return type. In this case, the return type is unit, um, which has a very specific meaning in quantum, which means that it doesn't really return a value. It's just a unitary operation on a vector in a vector space. Uh, because the state of our qubit is represented by a vector in a vector space. So it's a little bit linear algebra there our operation should actually be a unitary operation on that vector space. So if you know a little bit about uh, linear algebra, that will sound very familiar to you. Th those uh, vectors can actually be represented by matrices and you can do operations on top of those matrices. But this operation that we are writing right now is a unitary operation. You can also write operations that actually return values um, to use as like utility methods. You can also use functions which will uh, perform some classical uh, things like if you have an if statement that does something with numbers, calculates with numbers, that is actually a function and not an operation because an operation works on qubits. If I want to put a qubit in superposition, just like I did on uh, IBM Q experience, I can do something like using Q equals a qubit. Um, this looks a little bit weird. But basically using is the same thing as in C sharp. We are asking the system for a qubit. Um, that qubit needs to be assigned to us. And then when we're finished with that qubit, it needs to be disposed of. That's why we're using the using statement. Um, we're not doing new qubit. No, this qubit is actually a function. Uh, hence the, the um, these uh, brackets here. Um, and it's a kind of a factory function. So we actually ask for give me a qubit and it will give me a qubit. And now I can, I can do operations on top of this qubit. So if I want, for example, to, um, to do the superpositions, so the H gate or the Hadamard gate, I can just call a function called H on top of my qubit, just like you would call a function in C sharp and give it, give your qubit as a, as a parameter. Um, so now we have a qubit that is in superposition. So in C sharp, we can now measure the state of that qubit by calling the measure function. So we can do something like let result equals a measurement of Q. Then we can do something like message. Uh, and this is just like C sharp. You can do string uh, interpolation on top of the result variable. Um, and this will display uh, the state of that qubit. So if I do view terminal and I do .NET run, it will run this Q sharp application and hopefully it will uh, print a message to the console. Um, we are writing quantum programs, but we are using .NET run to actually run the, those. That doesn't really make sense. Uh, agreed. Basically, what happens is that Q Sharp is a language that will create quantum algorithms, but I don't have a quantum computer at home. So I want to test my algorithm on my classical computer. And so Microsoft created 
a, a simulated environment, which is part of the Quantum Development Kit. So the Quantum Development Kit is a plugin you can install for Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code or both, but each has its uh, has its own plugin. And within that plugin is actually the link between Q Sharp and .NET. And .NET will actually have some some have will have a compiler and will also have a simulator that will work with Q Sharp code. So in this case, we're actually running our application as a .NET application, which will start a quantum simulator, which in the backend, so uh, in memory, it will actually do all of these mathematical calculations for us. So it will create those um, mathematical representations in memory. It will calculate with some linear algebra. And that is also the reason why it's very hard to run your quantum algorithms on your local PC. Now I'm only using a single qubit. So the mathematics is not very complex, but if I'm using 20 qubits, for example, and I need, I, I, then I need a two to the power of 20 um, complex numbers in memory, and I need to do linear algebraic um, operations on top of all of those complex numbers. So I, I have huge matrices, and I need to multiply these huge matrices with other with other matrices, and that. There's, there's so much CPU power and so much memory needed for that, that it becomes very hard to uh, simulate uh, quantum programs with, with which are using lots of qubits. Um, but Q Sharp is actually a language that is also able to run on physical quantum computers. And that is something that Microsoft is working on right now uh, with their uh, Azure Quantum project. Um, while I was explaining, you can see that we actually have a result. You can see the result was one because we had a 50% chance of uh, the result being one, but we also have a 50% chance of it being zero. So if I run it again, I still have a 50% chance and I still have one. So let me run that a couple of times and hopefully zero will come up. So yeah, now we have zero. So basically when you run this application an infinite amount of times, you will see a perfect 50-50 um, correlation between zero and one. So this is, this is how the basics of Q-sharp work. Um, it's very similar to what IBM does with their visual representation. Basically, IBM also has a, has a language underneath the surface, which is called QASM or quantum assembly language. Um, it's, it's, it looks very much like Q sharp. It's uh, well, it's a little bit more like Python. It looks a little bit more like Python. Um, but the concepts are the same thing. Um, I can see somebody uh, in the chat going, but not both at the same time. Yeah, uh, zero or one, but not both at the same time. Um, yeah, so the, the languages look a little bit the same. Um, they are used in the same way. The, the Quasm will run on IBM hardware, but Microsoft really decided to create a Q-sharp language before they actually have a quantum computer because they want to create a generic language that can be used on multiple hardware, um, on multiple kinds of hardware, uh, basically. Uh, and I will come back to that uh, in a minute. Um, if you want to see a more complex uh, quantum application, on my GitHub page, there's many examples of some algorithms and also uh, some games. And uh, for example, I will open a game. I don't have the time to explain the game, but this is what Q-sharp looks like when you really use some more code. Uh, so for example, you can still write messages to the console, um, you can um, define variables like number of games. So I'm going to play a game 10,000 10, times because I want to work with probabilities. Um, this is a variable that is actually immutable. So if you create a variable with let, you cannot change the value afterwards. Um, but if you want to have a variable that can change afterwards, you need to create it as a mutable. You can do for loops just like you can in C sharp and F sharp. So I can run this piece of code a total of 10,000 times. Um, basically, if you want to learn about this game, it's called the CHSH game, and it's a, a game of chances. And Alice and Bob are two players uh, in that game. And if I run that game, let me try to run it um, very quickly in my console. That, and then .NET run. Um, the idea of this game is, is that if um, Alice and Bob use classical, their classical way of thinking um, to devise a strategy, they will actually have a winning chance of 75%. So they will have a three over four chance of uh, being successful in that game and actually winning the game um, in, a, in a classical world. But if they take a quantum approach and if they use entangled qubits um, 
And by using those entangled qubits, um, they can somehow communicate to each other, not really, um, but they have entangled qubits, so they can basically uh, have a, another kind of strategy. They can win the game with a chance of 85%. So the, the chance of winning the game is higher when you think about it in a quantum way. So this, this example is actually uh, also for you to grasp that quantum computers can actually be uh, cooler for us, more power, powerful for us, but also can gain us in probabilities um, and actually can make us more probable of winning or finding a solution to a problem. Uh, very cool. So here you can see uh, what, what Q sharp looks like. You also have helper methods like bool array as integer. So I'm actually, ha I, I have a, an array of booleans and I'm just converting that into an uh, integer uh, to basically go from a binary representation to an integer and stuff like that. And the reason that I'm showing you this is that on top of that, Microsoft is actually trying to make Q sharp into a higher level language. So instead of putting your qubits through gates, they are trying to create methods and operations that you can use on a higher level that you, for example, can do stuff like, I want to have two qubits that are entangled. So I'm not going to, to do that by hand. I'm going to use a, a function that is already available in some kind of namespace that is already part of the base class library for Q sharp. So in a couple of years, I expect Q sharp to be a language that is closer to something that we know like Q sharp and that we can already use pieces of algorithms um, that already exist and that we can just reuse in our in our problems to solve. Uh, very cool. Basically, um, another thing that you can see here is that you still need to know a little bit of math because if you want to solve your pro problems in a, in a smart way, you're actually rotating vectors in three dimensional space. So in this uh, this specific quantum operation is actually rotating a vector around the y-axis within the block sphere with uh, this amount of degrees. This is, uh, again, in radians. So this is 2 pi over 8 radians, um, which is um, 11.25 degrees or something, if I'm correct. Maybe I'm not correct. Who cares? I can't do math from the top of my head. I need a calculator. Um, but yeah, you have to think about uh, those things in order to succeed in quantum. So this is Q-sharp. Now, what is Azure Quantum? Well, as I told you before, Microsoft wanted to be first with a language that is actually useful for creating quantum algorithms. And with Azure Quantum, they really want to make uh, available real quantum hardware to us to use. Um, so Azure Quantum is basically a quantum in the cloud. And that is also something that I believe in, that a quantum computer that sits in your office is probably not really going to happen in the next few decades. Um, we are going to use quantum computers that live somewhere in the cloud and we are going to use them as a service. Um, so we are going to create algorithms that are actually part classical and part quantum. And we are going to run the classical part of the algorithm on our own environment or on an Azure environment, like on a web application or on an Azure function or something like that. And then we're going to communicate with an, uh, an Azure quantum workspace to calculate the quantum part of our uh, problem solving uh, algorithm. And then Azure quantum will run that on an actual quantum computer that will give us a result and we can uh, fetch that result and we can work again in a classical way with that um, with that result. And why are we going to use this? Well, quantum in the cloud is going to be used for optimization. Uh, and that, this is already available in a very limited preview. Um, so it's not yet out there in preview for the entire world, but only certain people uh, from, from the community are able to, to use these optimization strategies. And basically that is not really quantum computing. So already today we can uh, create algorithms that use uh, quantum optimized uh, solutions to our problems, but that is just running on classical hardware. But uh, the reasoning behind that is that now that we are working with quantum, we can actually create classical al algorithms in a quantum way of thinking, and then already uh, have some benefit there uh, in, or, uh, in, in regards to uh, performance. So we do quantum optimized algorithms and that is already available in the cloud. I have a very small example of that. Um, so if I open my browser, uh, so this is, this is Azure. Um, I have access to the limited preview of Azure Quantum, but I'm actually forbidden to show you. Um, there's like an NDA thing going on, but I can show you um, 
a little bit what it's going to be like. So if I type Azure Quantum and I want to create an Azure Quantum workspace, I can create Azure Quantum from here and it will create a workspace for me. And then if I look at my resources that are already there, I can see that I have some workspaces already created. And you can see that there's a workspace called Quantum Optimization. So this, is, this was what I was talking about. So this is already a preview of those quantum Optim, uh, those quantum uh, optimization things that actually don't run on a, on a, on a quantum computer. And I can run uh, an example from Microsoft to give you an idea of why we would use something like that. Um, this, for example, is a Python script that will calculate uh, a ship loading problem. And a ship loading problem is actually, I have two ships and I have a whole set of containers and all of these containers have a different weight. This is an optimization problem because I need to uh, put containers on one ship or the other ship based on how heavy they are. And I need to, um, I need to load those ships that they have about the same weight when I can ship them off to wherever destination they need to go. So if I run this script by doing Python and then my a script and I run that, this will actually connect, this will actually create um, a problem in, in Python where it has an array of uh, container weights. It will then uh, send those values to Azure Quantum Works, to my Azure Quantum Workspace. And now Azure Quantum is running the optimization problem in a quantum way of thinking. And it's actually uh, sorting those containers on the ships based on um, the, the weight. And now you can see that, for example, container zero with weight one was placed on ship A, then another container with weight five was placed on ship B. And when we're finished, we can see that the total weight is 52 tons for the first ship and 53 tons for the second ship. So now we have loaded those containers and we have optimized this problem. And there's lots of these optimization problems that we have today uh, for loading ships, for example, but also for doing uh, the traveling salesman problem. So when we have a salesman that needs to needs to travel the country and need to visit different locations, we can calculate the optimized path for him to, in order to not lose too much time while tra traveling between points. It's the same kind of optimization problem. So these kinds of problems can actually be run on uh, Azure Quantum uh, in a more performant way than we could on a classical computer because they have the cloud uh, and the cloud has the leverage of actually using lots of hardware to to, to, reach, um, to reach a solution to our problem. And while this is happening, Microsoft is also working with external parties and with their own teams um, to actually make available real quantum hardware through uh, this uh, quantum workspace. So as I told you before, uh, Microsoft is already working on a quantum computer based on topological quantum um, qubits. Um, then they work together with companies like IonQ and Honeywell, and they are creating quantum computers that are based on ion-trapped qubits. And they are also working together with a company called QCI, and they are, um, they are working on a superconducting um, quantum computer. And this is, if you don't know what these kind of computers are, well, I also don't really know in, in, in the real uh, nitty gritty details, but I know, for example, that topological qubits, uh, well, let's start with the beginning. Basically, when we want to create a physical quantum computer, we need something that can represent the qubit. So we need an elementary particle. We need to have that and we need to be able to manipulate that particle in order to be in superposition when we want it to be. And we need to measure it when we want to measure it. That is very hard to do because those elements are tiny and the world we live in is very chaotic by nature. So if you have a, an electron, so electrons are floating uh, before your face all of the time, we need to pick one, we need to isolate it. So we need to uh, remove all the air from the equation. So we need to create a vacuum. We need to uh, get the temperature very low. So there is there is almost no movement within these tiny particles. If if your temperature is lower, there's no uh, there's uh, less movement. So it, it's it's a little bit more stable. Um, and we really need to be careful. If that particle comes into touch with another particle, they will interact with each other, and maybe we will lose our superposition state, or we will lose our complex state that we are trying to represent. So very hard to do that. And there's different ways uh, we can do that. And scientists are working very hard today to find these ways and to find ways that are stable. Um, so Microsoft is working with topological qubits. And this is a very special kind of, of, uh, of, of element that we call topological, which means that, that 
those objects are by nature a lot more stable, but it's very hard to reach um, something like that. So that's the reason why Microsoft is still working on that um, and that they are not yet finished because it's, it's a very uh, hard thing to do. So their scientists are, are, are really uh, working on that. IonQ and Honeywell, they are using a different approach. They're using ion traps. And an ion is some kind of, of, um, of element, some kind of uh, atom that has a positive or a negative charge based on uh, too many electrons or too, or too few electrons. Um, and they are using um, um, uh, electromagnetic fields to isolate these ions. So they can separate ions and they can hold them in electromagnetic fields. And then they can use laser beams to actually change the states of these, um, of these, uh, of these um, states, change states of these uh, objects, I mean. Uh, and then QCI is using superconducting qubits. Um, that's the same thing as what IBM is doing. Um, they are also using elementary particles like electrons and stuff like that. But they are using this, also the super cool environments, the vacuum environments, and they are using microwaves to actually change the states of these um, of these properties uh, of these values and that's everything that i know i'm not a i'm not a physicist on, unfortunately so if i'm reading these um these reports from universities that are working on this uh, my nose begins to bleed and i think okay i want to go back to c sharp and dotnet so yeah that's all, all i can all i can talk about but what microsoft is, is trying to do with all of this and with their q sharp is basically create a language that is capable to work with all of these different um hardware systems without us as a developer needing to know what the system behind it is so they do the same thing as they do with .NET. they're using some kind of intermediate language so basically when you write c-sharp code and you compile that and you uh, send that to azure quantum to, to be run on a, on a quantum computer um, that will actually be compiled into what they call queer or quantum intermediate representation which is some kind of machine code but not really machine code um, this representation will then be sent to the quantum computer and then the hardware vendor like INQ and Honeywell or QCI, they will do the, 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 the final translation part. So they will translate the QIR um, uh, language into the actual machine language that they need for their quantum computer. Um, and that should actually work because all of these quantum computers that I'm talking about here are what we call universal quantum computers. And there's lots of companies today working on these um, universal quantum computers and that are, that are that are quantum computers that are able to work with um, all of these gates. So we have quantums, uh, we have qubits, they have a way of physically representing a qubit, and then we have the universal uh, language of quantum computing using these universal gates, like an H gate and all, all of the other gates. Uh, and because of that, we can use Q sharp because Q sharp will just use those gates in the final end. It will use some kind of combination of those gates, uh, applying one gate after the, the other gate in a specific order. Um, and the quantum intermediate representation will then be translated by the hardware vendor and he will actually apply those gates. So he will use the laser beams or the, the microwaves to, to uh, change the states of the qubits um, in order uh, uh, correlated to the actual gate that you want to apply. And for example, if we apply the Hadamard gate, we do uh, a 90 degrees rotation around the, the, the X and the Y axis to put a qubit in a perfect superposition. This can then be translated to uh, a physical uh, change by using uh, a laser or a microwave, and, and then they will be able to do that. And this already works. Uh, this is what IBM is doing. This is what IonQ is doing. Um, it works. Uh, there's also another vendor out there, which is called D-Wave. They're also creating a quantum computer, but they, they are using quantum annealing, which is a different way of doing uh, quantum computing. And it's actually something different than uh, universal quantum computers. So with the quantum computers from D-Wave, you cannot use uh, Q-sharp or some of the other languages that use the gates like the H-gate and the X-gate and the Y-gate and so forth. Um, they are just using something completely different. And it looks a little bit more like the quantum optimization, um, the quantum annealing. So, for, so D-Wave is doing it uh, differently. And, and so we have many companies trying um, and, and doing their take on quantum computing. 
um, but with with Q with Q sharp, we are really looking at these universal quantum computers that hopefully will be um, available somewhere in the near future uh, by using Azure Quantum. Um, to to finish my uh, presentation today, I'm just going to show you a couple of circuits um, to show you that these circuits don't really have to be complicated. Um, this, for example, is the circuit in order to uh, the circuit you need in order to entangle two qubits together. So, if you have two qubits in the zero state, we should we should put one qubit through the Hadamard gate, putting it in superposition, and then applying a C not gate in between of them. And a C not gate is just like uh, uh, an if with a not gate. Basically, it will look at the control qubit, which is the bottom one. So the, the small circle is the control part of the C0 gate, and it will look at that qubit. And if that qubit is one, it will flip the top qubit around the X axis. So if you have a qubit in a zero state, it will flip to the one state. And if you have a qubit in the one state, it will flip it to the zero state. So it's basically a not operation. So X equals not. Um, so this, yeah, C naught. So only when the bottom qubit is one will the top qubit be also be flipped to one. Now this creates something interesting because the bottom qubit is in superposition. So it's uh, it's not zero and one at the same time. It's a superposition between zero and one, which means that the C naught gate doesn't really work because the bottom qubit needs to be one in order to flip the top one. But it is not one and it's also not zero. It is a probability wave in between of those two values. And this actually creates the entanglement. So basically, when you do a measurement on one of these two qubits, the order doesn't really matter. Um, you will collapse the superposition, but you will collapse the superposition um, for, two, for the two qubits. Um, so the bottom one, if you measure the bottom one and it is one, the top qubit will also be one. And if you measure the, the, the bottom one and it is zero, the top one will automatically be zero because those two qubits are entangled. Uh, something to know is that in physics, the actual phys physics uh, entanglement is entanglement actually causes an opposite value. So zero would actually, um, and then two entangled um, qubits will actually cause them to be zero and one or one and zero. In quantum computing, uh, we have decided that they will always be the same. And so if you have entangled uh, qubits and you measure them, they will both be one or they will both be zero. Um, in the bottom here, there is a little bit of mathematics. Here, here I just want to show you that you can actually calculate with this. Um, it's, it's easy to calculate with binary values, but when you put a qubit in superposition, that becomes more difficult. But you can basically calculate by using some linear algebra what the actual output will be. And the out output will be this vector of a combined state with a 50% chance of collapsing to 1,1 one, one, or a 50% chance of collapsing to 0,0. Zero. And this is also a mathematical proof that I'm not going to explain right now, but it basically says that if this is if this is the two factors for um, for this factor, uh, and this is the the result of that, that you can't actually factorize this this matrix into its original uh, factors uh, because the two qubits are entangled, so they are both one or they are both zero, but they can never live. Um, uh, um, loosely from each other. They are always linked together. And that's what entanglement is all about. Another cool circuit, and the last one for today, is teleportation. Uh, in quantum, uh, when we have a qubit that's in a uh, qubit state, um, uh, so I'm sorry, when we have a qubit that's in a superposition state, we are actually able to teleport that superposition value, let's say, or state to another qubit. And this is what we call teleportation. And this is a very um, important concept in, in quantum computing. We can never copy a value from one qubit to another. If we have, for example, two qubits, and we put the first qubit in a specific state by, uh, by putting it through a number of gates, we can't take the second qubit and do something like, okay, copy the state from the first qubit to the second qubit. That does not work. There's only two things we can do. We can uh, put the second qubit through the same gates to eventually reach the same state, or we can teleport the state. And if we teleport the state from the first qubit to the second qubit, we will actually destroy the first qubit. And this is 
this is actually what teleportation is. If you remember uh, very cool horror movies from, from the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, uh, movies like The Fly, for example, um, where we were trying to do teleportation by teleporting a person from one booth to another booth, um, it's exactly the same thing we're doing with quantum teleportation. Um, we cannot copy something, we can only teleport it. Uh, if you put a human being inside of the first booth and you want to teleport it to another booth, well, in, in the quantum world, you would actually need like some kind of empty person in the second booth, a person without a soul or whatever, a person without anything. And we need to teleport the first human to the second human. And then that second human, the empty human, now has the same state as the first human, and the first human is destroyed. So he will be removed. Um, so that is what teleportation in quantum computing is also like. Your first qubit will just be destroyed, um, and it will lose its complex quantum state. But if you look at the circuit, you can see that it's actually not that complicated. There's only a couple of yellow gates that we are using, and we're using two measurements, and that's it, and we are actually teleporting. Um, I'm going to explain very quickly um, basically, Alice and Bob are two people that want to um, teleport a message. So Alice has a message and she wants to teleport that message to Bob. Um, Alice and Bob agree that they are going to do this in the near future. And the first thing that they need to do is to create an entangled um, qubit pair. So they have two qubits. They are putting it through the H and the C not gate to make those two qubits entangled. So Alice's qubit is now in superposition and it's entangled with Bob's qubit. Alice has access to the message and Bob takes, takes the train or the airplane and goes to the other side of the world. Uh, Bob still has its entangled qubit, Alice has the, her entangled qubit and the message. The next thing that happens is that Alice um, puts her qubit and the message qubit through the C0 gate one more time and then puts the message qubit through the Hadamard gate, also entangling her qubit with the message qubit. Now we have a uh, now we have three qubits that are all entangled together. And now Alice needs to do something very funky. She needs to measure her own qubit, which was zero to begin with in the zero state, but now it's in superposition. Um, and she needs to measure it and it will collapse to zero or one based on some kind of probability. Uh, that probability is dependent on her own superposition state, but also the entangled superposition state of the message. If it collapses to one, she calls to Bob and she says to Bob, you have a qubit that's entangled to my qubit and you have to put your qubit through the X gate to cause a rotation around the X axis. Um, if she measures zero, she doesn't call Bob. Bob need, doesn't need to do anything. The next thing that Alice does is she also measures her, her message and her message will collapse to zero or one. Um, and this is actually the operation that destroys the message qubit. Um, but if she, if, she, if she measures one, she calls to Bob and she says, I measured one, you need to put your qubit through the Z gate. Uh, and when Bob puts his qubit through the Z gate, magically the complex quantum state from the message, which is now lost within the message itself because we did a measurement, so it collapsed to zero or one, so the, 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 the complex data is gone. Um, but it's, it magically appears on top of uh, Bob's qubit. Uh, and that's what teleportation is all about. If you want to teleport uh, more data, you can just add more qubits to the equation. You just need more qubits to entangle more messages, uh, and you can teleport all of these. Um, of course, it is only able to teleport a complex quantum state. Um, you're not going to teleport a zero or a one, because of course, Alice still needs to call Bob on the phone and tell, tell him what to do so that uh, classical communication is still needed, so we still need to use classical communication in order to uh, communicate these two if statements, basically, um, but we are able to um, teleport the complex quantum states, so these complex uh, probabilities, even for a, a combined system. Uh, so if you have many, many qubits that are combined, we have a very complex state, we can teleport that state to a number of other qubits. So I will show you in Q sharp what that looks like. So I have another example on my GitHub, which is called teleportation. And this will be the last thing that I show you. Um, this is the teleportation part. So I'm actually rotating um, the vector in my qubit state, in my message, 
uh, with uh, something that is not a 50-50 superposition. So it's a 2 pi over 3 superposition, which is a 25-75% uh, thing. Uh, so now I have a more complex superposition state uh, that I want to teleport. And I'm teleporting these qubits using this operation. So if I look at the teleport operation, what happens is I need three qubits in total. So I, I already have my message. Uh, which is th this, uh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong method. I already have my message qubit, and I'm going to ask for two additional qubits. So I'm going to have Alice's and Bob's qubit, and I already have my message qubit. Then I'm going to entangle Alice and Bob's qubits. I'm going to entangle Alice and the message qubit, and then I'm going to do the, me the measurements. So Alice says, measure my qubit. If the result is one, Bob should put his qubit through the X gate. I will measure my message if the message is one, I will put Bob's qubit through the Z gate, and now I have teleported. And a cool thing about uh, Q sharp is that it also has debug uh, functionality. Of course, you are not able to debug your quantum algorithm on a real quantum computer, because if you debug, you are actually observing and you're destroying the quantum state because it now will collapse. Um, but in Q sharp, because we run it in a simulated environment, I can do something called dump register. And dump register will actually dump the mathematical representation of our qubit state to a text file. And we can read those text files to actually check if our algorithm does what we expect it to do. So if I look at those things, for example, if I look at the Q message before, this is a dump of the qubit state of our message before we are actually teleporting it. So you can see that indeed, as I told you, the wave function for this qubit is actually 25% uh, so 0 0.25 of collapsing to 0 and 75% of collapsing to 1. And this is that uh, mathematical representation with the complex number. So this is the alpha value and this is the beta value. So this is the 1 over 2 times, which is alpha, times the 0 state. And this is the square root of 3 over 2 times the 1 state. So this is that mathematical representation. And the cool thing is if you run this and you look at the Q message after, actually when you look at the um, yeah, when you look at the Q message after, you can see that it now changes to a zero state because it has collapsed to its uh, zero state. So now you lost the original message. But if you look at Bob's qubit, Bob, his qubit was zero to start with. But now after the teleportation circuit, so Bob's qubit after, has now the same complex state as my original message qubit. So we have successfully teleported the 25-70% um, superposition state from the message to Bob's qubit, which is very cool. Um, the, the circuit is simple. The Q-sharp is simple. Um, the physics behind it is, uh, I don't want to know. I really don't want to know. And um, this is going to be all the time that I will take with this. So hopefully you now have a, a little bit more of an understanding of what quantum computing is about, um, which way Microsoft is actually uh, trying to, to put this in the, in the public space. So they have created uh, an SDK, the Quantum Development Kit, which works together with .NET for simulation. You are, you are free to use that in uh, Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. Um, and, and the Q-sharp language, of course, um, which is, if you're already used to C-sharp and, and F-sharp, um, is quite easy to learn. Uh, of course, the quantum, the quantum stuff that lays beneath is a little bit more uh, difficult to, um, to learn, but now you, we have the tools to play around with this and hopefully gain a little bit more knowledge. And then when quantum computers really become a thing in the future, we already have some knowledge and we can, uh, we can learn faster because other people, they still need to learn the languages and they still need to learn all the theory. Um, so this is, this is also why I'm doing this. So let's see if I have some questions in um, Slido. I don't think I have. So uh, let's go back to Mike. Well, uh, thank you, Johnny. You had my mind blown, like literally blown. Yeah, I, was I don't know if it's there. There is a high probability that my brain is now in a superposition. OK. <laughs> I can't see any blood on your nice white wall, so that's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> um, green screen. Green screen. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah, I wanted to say thank you from my side as well. And uh, if people are watching and have any questions, do drop them in the chat window uh, or on Slido if, uh, if, if you still have it open. 
Um, I've also been chatting with Mike behind the scenes, and I think Mike has a question. Yeah, I cool. do have the I have the the topmost question on my mind now. Did you ever solve that riddle with that cat? Yeah. Thanks to this. <laughs> uh, yeah, not really. I I don't have a physical cat with me to try it out. Um, <laughs> but it's it's a um, it's a it's a funny story. Do you actually know what what that experiment is all about? That, because I I can exp explain it. You can explain to the audience. Okay, so it's know, yeah. um, so so Schrodinger's cat. Um, so people think it's a real life experiment, but it's actually not. So Schröd Schrodinger was a scientist, um, but he really did not try his experiment on an actual cat. But he was doing a thought experiment, and the thought experiment was that um, we know that uh, the quantum properties and, and things like superposition, they don't apply on things in the real world. Uh, I mean, in, in macroscopical things, they don't work on cats. A cat cannot be in superposition. But he was doing a thought experiment that said, okay, what if I put a cat in a box and within that box, I also put an elementary particle. I can't remember which particle, but it was a particle that um, used some kind of uh, nuclear property so mm -hmm. that it that it would um, cause that it would cause a poison bottle to break and because of that poison bottle that breaks the cat will, can actually be alive and dead and the, re the reasoning behind it okay the the elementary particle that causes this <laughs> to happen is a quantum particle that's in superposition and we put that all in a closed box and it is in superposition um, because it generates a sequence of events that will actually cause a poison to be released or not released, because now we have a 50-50% chance of poison releasing or not releasing, is the fact that the cat dies from that poison also in superposition. So this was the thought experiment. And I don't think it's ever solved. Um, we never tried it, but it doesn't work like this. So you can't make a dependency between a macroscopic object and a, and a microscopic object to actually force superposition on a cat doesn't work like that um, but it's a it's, it's still a cool thought experiment yeah because this is what quantum was all about right this is what they wanted to to prove with quantum too so yeah that's why i asked the question though. indeed exactly that's pretty cool yeah thanks yeah no questions coming in in the meanwhile, so I guess we can wrap it up here. Uh, okay, the perfect. Session of Azure this year. Again, thank you, Johnny. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. And um, yeah, like Mike announced earlier during the session, I think we can wish you happy holidays, keep things safe, and uh, let's hope 2021 brings us back together in, uh, in real life as well. I surely hope so. I think 2020, 2021 will be in a superposition too. <laughs> it's awesome. We'll have to measure it. Thank yeah, you. we we, we okay. didn't we didn't take the decision yet. Thank you. Yeah, Bye, guys. See ya. Bye. Bye.